coming up on Theater Talk. Producing is, I think, um, about all sorts of things, but one very important thing is it's about knowing when and how to say no. I mean, that's the gig. It's not concierging or catering or whatever. It's, it's about, and I think that comes from... And the how part, too. No, what I mean, the, the, yeah, uh, absolutely. How to no, say it's a finesse no. that how you do it. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. For the last six months, Broadway has been fixated on the saga of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. It's the most expensive show in Broadway history. As you know, it has all sorts of problems from injuries, the firing of the director, Julie Taymor. It's about to open again on Broadway in a new version. But before we plunge into uh, the new version of Spider-Man, I was very curious to get a sense from Broadway producers what it's like when you're in the center of a storm, of a show that isn't working out, when it all goes wrong. And so I've asked two of the smartest Broadway producers I know to join us to talk about the negative side of Broadway, the, the, the flop side of Broadway. We are joined by two gentlemen who've had big hits, I must uh, say, before we get into the, to the tragic part. Um, our good friend Michael David, who is the producer of Jersey Boys, a terrific revival years ago of 42nd Street, uh, the groundbreaking The Who's Tommy, Titanic, a show I always loved, and a terrific revival of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Welcome, Michael, to Theater Talk. Uh, the hardest show that you ever did, though, that was a flop? Before I move on to Manny, that sticks in your mind? It was a flop. That was a flop, yeah. The one that you had that still hurts to this day. Well, well few hurt to this day when you come down to it. I mean, I, I, I tend to go with a cup half full, so even the flops and, 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 and the words relative anyway, you can... My, my sense about success on Broadway is the mutual accomplishment of art and commerce, and it's very frequently happens that you have great accomplishment with art and, and it flops. So, so I, I, I can't, I don't mean to be evasive, but the fact is we've been pretty lucky to have at least one part of that work. Yeah, I'll just say, throw it out there, Footloose, Footloose. one that didn't work for you. No, no, I think, I think the, 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 the show that on second thought we might not have done, although everybody begins the show thinking it's a great idea, is Good Vibrations. Good Vibrations, okay. Uh, we're also joined by Manny Eisenberg, the producer of Broadway Bound, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Moving Out, a show I really, really loved, um, and uh, uh, several other Neil Simon plays, including 45 Seconds from Broadway, which was not a success. But Manny, for you, what was the most painful one of all the ones you've done that still, you still wear the scars of that one? Sideshow. Sideshow, a musical by... Sideshow, Brighton Beach Memoirs the second time, and Ragtime. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, Michael, when I've been cataloging the saga of Spider-Man and all of the trials and tribulations in the preview period, it reminded me of what you went through on Titanic, which wound up winning the Tony Award and was a show that I loved. But you were in this lengthy preview period. The press was all over you, covering every move, and it was nothing but doom and gloom. What was like... What was that like for you, the leader of this show? Well, well, well. First of all, it, it was it, it was inherently kamikaze to choose to do a show <laughs> called Titanic. I mean, it asks for it, and I think we knew it going in. Um, and the other part of it, which I think relates to Spider Man, is as all shows are different. I mean, we on new material we tend to want to do it first someplace else. Right. In the old days with privacy, uh, to test chemistry, the art, et cetera. But, but some you can't. And Titanic, in its own small way compared to Spider-Man, we needed to destroy a basement. We needed to build three stories, and one of them was underground to do all of our stuff. And there was no way you could sort of do that out of town first and then sort of come on in again. So we were stuck, I suppose, doing it you know, in situ in New York. And uh, the idea then of finding yourself working on something, something, if you will, as fragile as um, a potential art with artists and artisans, um, sort of uh, called Titanic with everyone, whether it was good or bad, watching it because of all the obvious one-liners. The bad jokes we all made in the Totally, and they were all made. They were all made. But I do think that in the midst of that process, if a show begins to go off the track, you know, on to, starts on a siding. It's unbelievably difficult to sort of reel it back in and shape it this way. It just takes too damn long. Everybody else has to do stuff. And, and in the end, there's a kind of desperation or whatever that happens. Um, but, but, but 
But for me, what happens in the situations, and I think, frankly, it happens in its own way during any preview period, which I love as a, as a, as a time to work on something. Mm -hmm. Everybody's working so damn hard, so committed to the show. You know, yes, you're parenting people who are, but most everybody is so dedicated that, 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 that repression really doesn't need to happen. Didn't I, you set up a war room, though, where you could go away from prying <coughs> after the show, not at a restaurant, but at a hotel somewhere, where you could meet and that nobody would, you know, overhear conversations and that kind of thing? The, the, the war room is a, uh, is a circumstance we've created for almost every show we've done. Mm. So as much as a few beers around the table at Sam's or wherever we went, um, uh, we've always had a place where you could go away from it all before the performance or afterward, food there, and you'd sit and that's where you'd talk. On Titanic, as it turns out, without getting into who and what, we had a, we had a war room breakfast and a war room dinner. Because, um, <laughs> director in one, authors in the other. Right. Uh, Manny, when Michael says when it begins to go off the rails, a show, it's hard to get back, when is it that you know, as the producer, it's going off the rails? Is there usually a moment in the process where you think it's going to be tough to get it back? When you separate the ones that fail from the ones that are turkeys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> you asked me about which, which, the ones that are painful, the sideshow, I, I never thought it went off the rail. I liked it. Mm. We commit to doing it, and we like it because it, of what it was. There are shows that you think are good, and then there's that uh-oh moment. Mm. And the one that I know you're going to get to is the goodbye girl. Yes. What was the uh-oh moment for the you? The uh-oh moment goodbye was the first reading. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you, <laughs> even though every component was a first-class component. Neil Simon and Marvin Hamlisch. Neil Hamlish. Simon, Marvin Hamlisch, Gene Sachs, Bernadette Peters, Martin Short, Graziella Danielle. It was all. And then you put it all together and... You knew that, uh-oh. But what do you do? You're sitting there at that reading, you say, uh-oh, it's trouble. Do you fight it out, or do you think it's going to be a losing no. battle? No. The one thing that I think is more important than anything in, in Michael's position and my position is that you don't leave the canoe. You go down with that ship, and you put a smile on your face, and you make everybody work as hard as they can to improve it as best you can, however clumsily, even if you don't know what the hell you're doing, and you show up. And you show up after it opens, after you guys kill it, <laughs> after it's ridiculed, and because the audience that comes in is entitled to the best performance you possibly can get, and the actors need that support. You certainly don't abandon the show. But you as the producer go into the goodbye girl and you go, the reading, you go, uh-oh. You can't say to Neil Simon, because he's Neil Simon, gosh, this isn't working, Neil. He knew too. Well, so then... Everybody knew there was something wrong. But, that, but then that sounds like madness that you're continuing yes, off the cliff. it is, because they're all finger-pointing to the other guy. <laughs> Not me, it's him. <laughs> and then you have to kind of adjust that. Well, you work on yours and you work on this. We need a new song over here. What about those transitions? What are we going to do going from this number to that number? And there's no one facing facts at that time? It's very subjective. Uh -huh. I know this question is asked all yeah. the time. Didn't you people know? <laughs> <laughs> You're Michael's laughing. When you have a failure, that's what everybody, didn't you know? Yeah. Well, initially you don't know. You begin to get a hint at some point. Mm. In that case, we knew at the beginning, and then you try to fix it. Michael, you were laughing. Didn't you know when they, when they come up to you and say, how could you possibly have done good Look, I, th I, think, I think there are sort of two twisted icons out there in the future that might keep you going. And I'm with him. I mean, the job is parenting, the opening night party, the opening night thing. You know the reviews are bad. You're there hugging people and doing the thing. And then you talk to the cat. I mean, all of that, that's the gig, you know. And uh, at some point in the future, you, you crash and burn for a day, and then you sort of put it together. But there are these two sort of twisted things you can perhaps look to. One is that occasionally you can turn it around, mm -hmm. that, that occasionally you can rescue this thing that doesn't seem to be what it's going to be and it's out there. So that's one. Maybe we can fix it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the idea we had isn't so bad after all. And the other one is, uh, and it's a fact without sort of naming names, sometimes bad shows run. <laughs> so, 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 you know, you're a custodian not over sort of the art, but also the commerce. So there are all these people who have given you this money, and they're, you know, and you're responsible to it. And, and that's a driver, too, like it or not. Mm -hmm. And... And so we could all sit here at some private time when the lights are low with alcohol and talk about the shows that are bad that are still running or the shows that are bad that ran. But I do think that there is, it's a twisted goal 
but nonetheless, you are in a, in a, you've chosen to work in this world that is, that is, that is um, combined, coalesced directly to be the thing can't just be good. It's got to pay for itself. It's got to be, it's got to be accessible and commercial. Mm -hmm. Is it money that you keep going to just see if it can make money no matter what? Or is there a time creatively you go, well, no, this isn't happening, so I'm going to uh, stop? Well, I think you're, but I think you're sort of trapped in the process, and you're responsible for all sorts of folks. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this is, titles are really the names for this sort of, this, this temporary consol consolidation of sort of independent contractors who are, you know, sort of all getting together for this moment. Ah for a real salary and health insurance on a big idea that they're all into. And the fact is, it's, it seems, I mean, abandoning that, abandoning the money, I mean, you know, you've, it, it's, it's, I think, I think um, you don't want anyone to think it's, it's, it's gone. I mean, it may, it may work, and, and so I think you, so you, 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 don't, you don't close. You don't close until you're losing money. Let me ask you when you say, uh, and the blame game begins. I mean, you are kind of the parent, are you not, as the producer? And you're always, it's always his fault. That's why, yeah. But, and you're dealing with, you know, very, very talented people, many of whom I know well, and I've also seen them when things are not going right, and they just, you know, become animals. How do you get people to behave? I, ha I have to say, I, I, and I mean this sincerely, yeah. um, I haven't worked around a lot of animals. I mean, the, especially in this time. I mean, I, it just, it just... It's not part of the world I found myself in, and whether that means we, you know, we avoid the pathological, we, I don't know, but basically at this time it's usually been sort of hard work. That is, that's not to say that that doesn't happen occasionally, but it is occasionally. It's not normal. Do you have these, to be these, a peace, peacemaker sometimes? Sure. I mean, it's this, our, our gig is, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. Not sometimes. You bet you, I mean, oh, that's the gig. A lot. That's, that's the job, mm. you know, you're... This is it's a it's a it's a figure out who, who gets fired, right? If you're talking about a musical, who gets fired? The book writer gets fired. The director gets fired. Yeah. The composer never gets fired. Yeah. Why? Because you can't you start totally from scratch with a composer. Yeah. What's I want to ask you? You've all had to fire people. Julie Taymor has been fired from Spider-Man. I mean, personally, what is that like for you to go to Gene Sachs in the Goodbye Girl, a man that you were very close to, that Neil was close to, and say, "I'm sorry, Gene, you're fired." Well, Neil's brother, Danny, on the Odd Couple. Oh, I didn't. What was Danny doing on the Odd Couple? He was directing the female Odd Couple. And you had to fire him. You take a deep breath. <laughs> you fantasize it about what I'm going to say and how macho, and you drink a lot, and then you tell them. Mm. What's your approach? You come up with euphemisms. I mean, uh, it's not the. Uh, it's uh, this is the on Tuesday would be a better day. I mean, you make up whatever. <laughs> you Absolutely. Make up. And it's not really all of it's not all about you. It's no. the chemistry. It's just a mix. And you'll get paid. You know, but you'll get, get paid. You're you'll get, get paid. Well, jumping a girl. <laughs> yeah. What can we do? Well, I mean, there's there's something like that. Yeah. And I must say, I like to do it not alone. Mm -hmm. So so um, it'll be a couple of us who will sort of do it. I remember uh, people with guns mostly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel about um, the press coverage now? Um, I I've been around a long time, and a lot of shows that both of you guys did, I began and we began in the press covering previews in aggressive way for the first time, and it has now all completely exploded with Spider-Man, where everything has been covered. Are we just Spider being... Spider-Man is the, the exception. It's an anomaly if ever yeah, there was. Yeah, you know, the, the shows don't preview for four months. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So there was always an understanding, a professional understanding. You came in from out of town or wherever, and then you were given a, a decent period of time to, to fix the show or just even to light the show or to... Yeah, fine tune but, the shows. But parenthetically, you were around on the one that did get fixed to a certain extent. Moving out got fixed. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw it out of town in Chicago and, and it was, was and it was better when it came in. It was terrific when it came in. So I have to say on Titanic too, I saw the first preview of Titanic and you couldn't sink the ship, remember that? You couldn't couldn't sink the Titanic at the end. And well, but I, I have to say just We be, laugh now. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I remember I was sitting on this side and Rich was on the other and he had come early. He wasn't there to review. Rich Fra oh Frank, Frank Rich was yeah. sitting there and it was like it also began, I don't know if you remember, it began we had drops come out of the floor. Yeah. And I remember the first drop or second drop comes out and a, a great moment. It comes out of the floor and it hooks. And it just tears from top to bottom oh. as the or overture is finishing all the way up. So there's this and you're just <laughs> You know, but, but I mean, I must say, you know, there's another, and that's the gig. And I think sense of humor has a lot to has a, has a lot to do with to it. do with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but just going back to this issue of the press, do you think we have it has become unfair the way we are scrutinizing every show out of town now? We're re reporting on every workshop now. If you're 
if you're previewing in town, chances are we're going to be there at your first preview, and this stuff is going to get out. Well, look, I, I, I think if, if you respect the work that's being done here as something that you know, ought to be as enhanced, enhanced as much as it possibly can, then I can't imagine what good there is to have people sort of hovering over the work as it's being done by artists and artisans before they say they're finished or they're done. I mean, that can't be productive. Um, and so, you know, I, I hate it. But there's, there's something, <laughs> something a, a little bit more insidious in all of this. One is some things are done so that you do come and see it and let everybody know whether it's going to be successful in New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when Isherwood flies out and sees something in California, if he writes a bad notice, that's not coming in. Right, right. But or, I, or in Atlanta or something. And if he writes a good notice, but nobody ever and it is coming in, and it, it's and nobody ever complains on your side of the fence when we go to see something early on and say this is great. You know, you see an early preview of Jersey Boys and you say, get ready, the the, the big winners here this season. I didn't get any angry phone calls on that <laughs> no, one. It's only because we can't stop you. <laughs> what are we going to do? But stop I mean, really, you? If, if, if you? No, but I think Manny's totally right. If the if the, if if the and this used to happen, a call would come in. I'm going to be going to the West Coast. I hear you got something or whatever. You mind if I? come in or the, the the theater itself would say you know sometimes we invite uh, press from around the country and I, I think I can say now that that we sense that there were invites going to, all, to, to to folks all over but but even that process is gone now it is yeah you know it's it's and of course we have the internet too which is you know every well, well, that's that's part of the spider-man thing too given the situation of spider-man you guys are experts in this area you've watched how they've handled the situation what's your judgment on the way this show has been produced so far? And would you have done something differently? Well, the answer, of course, would you have done something differently? You wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> done even differently because you don't expend $65 million or whatever that amount of money. It's beyond, <laughs> I would speak for Michael also, $65 million for a musical is beyond our understanding. <laughs> and, I, and in that sense, I think it's not a good precedent because now something that's going to cost $35 million, all the Participants are going to say, well, it's only 35 minutes, it's not Spider-Man. <laughs> but personally, I have compassion for them. They didn't start out to fail. They also didn't start out thinking they were going to spend 65 minutes. Exactly. I would have felt so better if they they're, said, they're, they're people it's who, going to be expensive. <laughs> That's not how it started. It was this gonna, is, you know. this is a, a nightmare for, the, for, for some, and I know some of those people, decent people. I think I think if you if you sort of lay out on paper what they must have done early on the enthusiastic not not fully experienced producers this looked pretty amazing I mean you'd have Julie and you had you two guys and you know this and you've got this brand with all these people which of course brings high expectations composers have never done anything for the theater for Julie who needs a, a strong a powerful collaborator mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and and ambitions that are inherently expensive mm -hmm. So, so um, I guess I'm sort of with Manny. I mean, I, I just think it's sort of t t too much to handle. I mean, I mean, I think it, it spelled um, danger. This is a, a great example of of going into the siding. Although I think Julie would say it's what I want. It's what I wanted. This thing would, was what, 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 I, what I wanted to do, you know. But as I said before, I mean, I, I feel nothing but really empathy for this situation and where they are and what that feels like. Um, and, uh, and, and it would appear now they're in so deep that you do what you can with these assets that have been created, these relationships that have been created, these aspirations that have been created, and see if you can salvage something. And you might even bumble on something good or something commercial saleable. or something saleable or something someone at least wants to see. I think they're trapped in their own, um, in their own um, uh, exciting project. <laughs> Can you, can you see, though, saying to an artist, any artist, you have an unlimited budget, and that then when the, the artist, and I'm Julie Taylor, is sitting there saying, oh, but I need six more costumes for this scene that I think is now, and that you or you would not have gone in and said, well, wait a minute, we just cannot do this. We cannot go on this other tangent now. I can't the write another isn't check. There. One of the pluses of having an, an entrepreneurial producer Michael makes a living doing this. I made a living doing this. So this is not institutional money. Mm. This is mine <laughs> and the, my Absolutely. friends. Absolutely. <laughs> and we have set a budget, and it's $12 million, and there are limitations. So if you've been around, you say no. If this means somebody leaves, then they leave. Mm. 
But you would have You'll said work no. You'll work on it. They're, they're, yes, and all the designers will come up with a half a million dollars more than what the budget calls for, and then you cut it. It's important, and what Manny says goes right to it, I think. I mean, we, we were dumb enough, stage struck enough to do this for a living. I mean, we have a company of people who, for 40 years, it just kills me to think, 40 years, making shows. I mean, you know, so, but now there are people who wouldn't fix their toilet without a plumber who think they can make a show, and the fact is they may be smarter <laughs> than 40 years of experience. But, but, but look, t two things when, when you start this. For starters, um, I think if you're going to paint the ceiling and it's going to be the Sistine Chapel, you measure the ceiling really carefully, you decide what it might, might cost, and that's what it costs. I mean, that's what, when you're going in, it's, that's what that's what's going to be. You know, and you know in your head it's give or take a little, but it's not give or take a lot. And you share this cost and these limitations with the people you're going to work with mm. when you hire them. This is what we're going to do. This, we, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and, and the other thing is, look, producing is, I think, um, about all sorts of things. But one very important thing is it's about knowing when and how to say no. I mean, that's the gig. It's not concierging or catering or whatever. It's, it's about, and I think that comes from... And the how part too. No, what do you mean? The, the, yeah, the, absolutely. How to no, say no? It's a no. finesse, thing, but how, how you do it? How, how when, you when, how you say when, when you say and no. how to say no? So in a way, you guys are you you become sort of psychologists that you have to take the the emotional and mental mental measure of your creative people and know exactly how to approach them you, and. You have a responsibility. You're the producer of of a musical. The artists don't want you to make artistic judgments, so you make the artistic judgments through the money. <laughs> you say, I don't, if I don't like something, really don't like something, I simply say, we don't have enough money for that. <laughs> That's an old trait. Well, I th well, but I think it too, and you she pick the hills to die on, you know, you really do, you know, have the dress. But with the next, you know, when two new terms and teasers come up, the fact is that's a hill you're going to die and we can't do it, you know. But just at the subject um, of these great artists like Julie Tamer, and I think we all agree that she is a great artist, tr you tremendous bet. artist. You worked, Manny, with another great artist, Twyla Tharp. Um, and you had some trouble with her and moving out, out of town, getting her to make the changes you want to make. How do you approach, how do you approach a real genius and get them to do what you have to make them do? What I said to Twyla was, and you can print this, <laughs> <laughs> I invoked Jerry Robbins. Because mm. you remember that show, and that show did not have a beginning. And I said, think of all of Jerry Robbins' shows. They all open with, Ba -ba 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 -ba. Comedy Tonight. Comedy Tonight, Tradition yep. for Fiddler. Yep. And you tell the audience something in that first number, which gives you 20 minutes of, mm. of exposition afterwards. It allows you. So Robbins would nail you right at the beginning, and you'd be so happy to be there, and then the exposition comes out. Mm. So that was your trick, that you, you could only talk to her through a great artist that she respected. Well, that's what I said to her. Her response to me was, I spoke to Jerry, <laughs> <laughs> and he was dead. <laughs> I knew he was dead, but it, I, I, so after, I hope that the hint got there. That's, yeah. was, and, and how about I you, I don't Michael? know how to commune with. And how about you, Michael, when you're dealing, let's, I don't know, with someone like a Stephen Sondheim on Into the Woods, or a more yes to a wonderful composer on Titanic, how do you tell someone like that, that that song that you've written, Mr. Genius Composer, is not working? We, we <laughs> well, look, f first of all, we have a system. Uh, called the funnel, where which was really created to protect the company and the artist from getting notes from everybody. And now there are 40 people over the title, and they all have notes. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> one person in our company gives notes to the director and no one else, not mm. to composers, not to anyone. The director delivers those things. And we, we deliver them in camouflage, if you will. We, we have a top 10 list. We go through, we get everybody's notes, we go through it, we prioritize it, and in the end, we want the first two, and there are eight more to make the lump. They get the whole thing, and hopefully... Um, you get it from them. I guess the overall thing, though, is that nobody sets out to produce a flop. Every show that you start no, out. And, and also, very often, the artist gets there by themselves. <laughs> they, get, they, get to, they get to making their changes, mm. and you pick your spots. Yeah. I once said that Neil Simon had a line about hemorrhoids in a play. <laughs> and you wait. And normally he gets rid of all of that stuff. It takes a week or two weeks. But this was three weeks. And was in there. I finally went over to Neil and said, hemorrhoids? And he said, 
Don't you think I know? I don't have anything <laughs> better. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, isn't it? It's a fascinating subject, and, and you guys are great for uh, engaging with us today. Um, Michael David, uh, Jersey Boys still going strong on Broadway. What's your next show coming up? A, a play with a wonderful person who will hopefully will do it, uh, <laughs> and five musicals that I'm happier in development now and not bubbling up in a season like this where all this stuff is in the end and coming together. They all need to get a chance, and so. Um, and Manny Eisenberg, what do you what do you have coming up next? I'm old. I'm. You I'm, keep saying you're you're retired, but I never. Ever, he says that well, every year. Are, and then you there come are up some the possibilities, but. But at, you know, $65 million, I'm, it's a little out of my league. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Manny Eisenberg, Michael David, thanks a lot for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Appreciate it. If you're looking for a night out on the town, you just found me. I'm a $65 million circus tragedy. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>